Hey guys, welcome back. Today we are starting a series of breeding experiments with our mutant bladder snails. It's going to be a lot of fun, and I'll talk more about it as we go in the video. I'll be building three nurseries for this project using wide mouth mason jars, all natural scallop shells, and a few handfuls of river stones. The jars I'm using are one quart in size, and I'll be building three of these. Uh, I want to separate different uh, types of bladder snails, basically. I want to take two of my normal snails and put them in a jar, and I want to take two of our mutants and put them in a jar as well, and then I want to take two snails that are descended from tails, our two-tailed snail. I want to take two of his offspring and isolate them as well. So, in these experiments, I hope that our snails will uh, develop new family lines within each jar, and these new bloodlines that I want to create here will be fathered by those two initial snails. So we'll have three different aquariums with three different populations of bladder snails, and because those populations are being started by two lone individuals, uh, they will be very, very inbred, especially as generations progress. So this will have the effect of concentrating or revealing recessive traits that may be hidden in their DNA. I believe the two-tail trait is in fact a recessive gene, and uh, this is one way we may be able to force it to reappear in future offspring. So, I won't lie guys, uh, this type of project will take quite a while, and for today we are just starting the setups here. We are just building the nurseries, and we are adding our snails and studying them just a little bit. I want to establish the background of where each population has come from. I want to show you, you know, what those conditions look like a little bit, and we'll go from there. So I am using guppy grass and water meal. Uh, our water meal was given to us by a swamp somewhere. <laughs> I found it in a pond and brought it home. And our guppy grass was given to us by our good buddy Clay at Wise Fishkeeping. Uh, Clay's a good dude. You should check him out. Uh, but yes, so we are using water meal and guppy grass here. Uh, some people might hate water meal, but I think it's the perfect plant for a jar aquarium. Uh, it's for, very proportionate for what I like to do. Uh, which are, they're basically nanotanks, but when I say nanotank, people imagine something completely different. So I try to say jar aquarium, even though a lot of people don't understand what I mean by that. It's a tough call. I was in a discussion the other day, the other day, <laughs> uh, with someone talking about sealed ecospheres and what they should properly be called, and uh, that was a whole big old topic. It was interesting. So I left the jars here under my sun lamp for about a full day, and now we're going to add our snails, starting with jar number one on the right. These are regular bladder snails taken from my guppy aquarium. I don't show the guppy, uh, the guppy tank much because it's crazy. I don't do fish tanks like most people do. And uh, I don't know if you guys are ready to see that. So yeah, I do have shrimp in here also given to us by clay. And I'm very grateful. And of course our bladder snails who seem to enjoy this corner a great deal. I don't know why. But they love it, so it makes it very easy for me to catch them when we need to take a few. And uh, these little shovels do a wonderful job of helping out with that. The guppy grass may look yellow or brown, and it is a little wilted, but a lot of that is from my sun lamp, which is on in the background. Uh, that's how I grow most of these plants nowadays with a $20 light from Good, or, uh, Walmart. Goodwill. <laughs> I wish. Uh, my tripod was from Goodwill. <laughs> a lot of my stuff, actually, I got from thrift stores and places like that. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's a lot of fun. You can find some magical items in a secondhand store. 
but here we are with our first bladder snails. Now I do want to see if uh, the generations of offspring that we create here, uh, if they will have the same color as these snails. That's a topic that I've been debating with you guys for a little while now. So it's hard to see in this lighting, but these snails are white, almost pink. And uh, if my hypothesis is correct, they will be all sorts of random colors as they have offspring and they grow up and so on. But if I'm wrong, uh, and colors can be passed down and inherited in these snails, which you would assume they could be, uh, then we should have a whole population there of white or pink bladder snails in the future. So that's jar number one. Here in the middle, this is jar number two. And for this jar, I'm using some very interesting snails taken from the mutagenic pond. Yes, I have a pond full of mutagenic compounds, zinc and copper and who knows what, uh, which is not good for the snails but it's only affecting them just enough to damage their DNA very slightly and uh, still allowing them to live. So it's not poisoning them in a fatal fashion, but just enough to modify their genetic structure. And though I joked about doing that for years, um, we kind of did it accidentally. And here we are today, making the most of what we have. So I believe that these snails will have the most interesting offspring as time goes by because they have the most recent exposure to a mutagenic compound. Uh, uh, pollution has affected them, and it's a good chance to study the effects of human trash and debris on the aquatic ecosystems. Here on the right are just normal bladder snails versus our weird mutants here. They are the same species, technically. Uh, they're probably a little bit older than our regular snails over here, and that's okay. Uh, we won't really be judging much by these uh, early individuals. It's their offspring. Once they start having babies and those babies start having babies again, then we'll really start to compare uh, the average member of each population uh, with their different traits and colors and whatnot. Uh, the snails in jar number two there in the middle, they are black. Black or dark, dark purple. So, yeah. And here in jar number three, we are going to use a few snails descended from Tails. Yes, some of his offspring. His aquarium may seem a bit strange, but it is accomplishing its goal exactly as it was designed to do so. It is not a gallery level aquarium. It's not something amazingly beautiful. It is a mutant snail nursery and it's doing great. Forgive me for fast forwarding here. I had to be very careful catching these little snails. Uh, and I didn't think that you would want to wait 10 minutes while I <laughs> coerce them to get onto my shovel. Yes, it's very, very dangerous for your snails when you try to move them to a new aquarium. They can be easily smushed. A few of you did ask about the plastic wrap and why I was using that specifically. And the answer is that it is a extremely cheap lid. It's, uh, it's clear, so it allows light to come in, uh, but it prevents the snails from coming out, and it also reduces evaporation. There is a small hole cut in the middle of the plastic to allow for airflow. Now I'm not that poor <laughs> that I have to use plastic wrap as a lid. I do have some mason jar lids as well. Uh, I just like to try out different ideas. That plastic wrap is an upgrade over my screen mesh, believe it or not, uh, which is a horrible lid for a tank like this. Yeah. So right away, we see that the mutagen-exposed snails are diving to the bottom of the tank, uh, much like Tails did when I first put him in his new aquarium. I find that very interesting and very odd. Um, it, there's a chance that, uh, you know, something that has affected their DNA could also affect their behavior. Uh, for instance, I once saw uh, some fruit flies that were modified to... Uh, become albino when they grew up, you know. So uh, they were modified, they hatched, they grow. But uh, 
Yes, uh, that one change to make them albino also caused drastic changes in their behavior compared to an average fruit fly. Uh, your average flies would be all over the jar freaking out, but your modified uh, GMO <laughs> albino flies would all form conga lines in their jar. It was amazing. Uh, but yes, the, the point was that even a small genetic change can completely influence the behavior of an animal. And yeah, that affected me and stuck with me for the rest of my life. But it makes me wonder if that might be what's happening here. So I'm adding a paper-thin slice of cucumber to each jar. And uh, this is day three. But uh, yeah, it's time to feed the snails. There's nothing in each jar. There are clean tanks. Uh, the only bacteria or algae that may be present would be on the guppy grass, and that's not going to last very long. I Actually, I want that bacteria to, to uh, not be eaten by the snails. I want it to grow. And so we are feeding the tanks, but we're also feeding everything inside. The bacteria, the microfauna. Uh, I'm sure there's some copepods and things that have snuck in here, and that's okay. Those are... I consider them part of my water at this point, if that makes sense. Uh, they're just here in the environment, they're with us. So as I mentioned, this will take a long time to develop. Your average bladder snail will lay eggs immediately uh, upon meeting another snail. <laughs> and uh, those eggs take about two weeks to hatch, roughly. So we're looking at a long-term project here. But I have other videos on my channel. Technically, this is part three of my mutant snail series, and we will see these guys again. I just want to build up some anticipation, some excitement. And I'm just so grateful for everyone that enjoyed the Tales video and the sequel. Uh, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for everyone who liked that video as well. That made my day. Uh, thank you to my YouTube members and Patreon supporters. You guys are awesome. And to everyone watching right now, you're the best. Have a great day. Oh, and, uh, you know, like, subscribe, all the good stuff. Please, please, thank you.